Grüezi ragazzi, welcome and bienvenue to Cannabis Sciences LinkedIn Live for this week. To those of you joining us live, thank you very much for being here with us today. And for those of you who will be checking out the recording at a later time, also a big thank you to you. Uh, we hope that you uh, not only enjoyed today's session, but that you perhaps also leave having learned something new. Uh, before we get started, just a little bit of uh, an intro about Cannabis Scienza. Uh, we aim to combat the bottlenecks of the medical cannabis industry using the power of education and through the training of healthcare professionals on the effective use of cannabinoid medicines. In doing so, increasing access to medical cannabis for patients worldwide. On your screen right now, you see an overview of our services as well as a QR code you can scan if you'd like to get in touch with us. Uh, also something that we're super excited about uh, on your screen right now, uh, you see that we have the upcoming launch of our Principles of Clinical Cannabinology Handbook. That's just around the corner. Amongst other things, it covers the endocannabinoid system, clinical practices, regulatory landscapes, as well as available products in different jurisdictions. Again, if you're interested in learning more about the handbook and reserving your copy, uh, or even learning about sponsorship opportunities, uh, please, please scan the QR code on your screen and get in touch with us. And last but not least, if you haven't already, please head over to the Cannabis Scienza LinkedIn page and hit that follow button. Uh, we have hit 1,000 followers and we do have something special planned. More details on that very, very soon. And now, without further ado to today's topic, we will be, we will be discussing the role of the can, we will be discussing the role of cannabinoids in the oncometabolic diseases, and we are joined today by a very special guest. Uh, we are very happy and grateful to welcome today's guest, tenured researcher, biochemical pharmacologist, research director at the National Research Council of Italy, with about 150 publications and close to 10,000 citations, Professor Alessia Ligresti. Uh, thank you for your patience during my monologue, Alessia, and uh, may I please ask you to perhaps uh, get started by introducing yourself? Hi, hi everyone. Thanks, Jung, and thanks for this kind introduction. I'm really honored today and extremely happy to be hosted in this live session today. So what I should uh, add to your kind introduction, well, the first thing is that I've been working on cannabinoid research since ever, since I graduated many years ago in 2001 after I joined the endocannabinoid research group uh, in Pozzuoli and then my scientific interest always focuses on investigating cannabinoid based therapeutic applications particularly in oncometabolic diseases and in developing uh, molecules which can selectively target the endocannabinoid system. So I've been always part of this beautiful society. Uh, I've also served when I was a student from 2005 up to 2007, the International Cannabinoid Research Society as a student representative. And I've also moved myself. I mean, uh, I've been visiting uh, as a visiting researcher, the Department of Biological Science at Arlergan Inch in 2005. Quite recently, in 2019, I was visiting professor at the Institute of uh, Research in Biomedicines in Barcelona. And last September, I was visiting professor at Major Institute of Polypharmacology of the Polish Academy of uh, Science in, uh, in Krakow. Just to tell you that uh, I'm really open to expand even my research interests and explore uh, more everything related to cannabinoid research. Before uh, fairly or going more into some uh, detail of my research, whatever, I should disclose that I also served as a consultant for many industries. I should mention here that I served as a scientific consultant for several companies and worth mentioning partic particularly Allergan Inch from 2012 up to 2016. 
And uh, basically that I've been actively collaborating with GW Pharmaceuticals. So everything related to phytocannabinoids in my research uh, data and research publication have been financially supported by, uh, by GW. I was really interested in collaborating with them for developing therapeutic application based on phyto, uh, phytocannabinoids, particularly in oncology disease. Uh, I, okay, uh, coordinated national programs, international private funding initiatives. I'm also actively involved in the simulation and mentoring activities. And I'm co-inventor of two patents. One of, the, of these two is actually about the use of phytocannabinoids in cancer. So I do believe that they really have a great potential in the oncology, but particularly in the oncometabolic diseases. Thank you. That was quite an introduction. Uh, I shall just try to, uh, start straight away with the topic of this conversation since you, you just mentioned. And actually give an opening to, to this uh, pretty deep research that actually you've been, you've been working on to set the scenario for everyone on really what are oncometabolic disease? Well, what are we talking about when we are trying to find the treatment? And, um, and before even trying to look at what, what is the role or potential role of medical cannabis in there, but really what, what pathologies are we looking at? Definitely, that definitely a good question for starting. Well, it's easy. Oncometabolic diseases are classical oncological diseases, which are considered from a different perspective. So actually, historically, cancer has been always treated as a complex disease. Both genetic alteration are were, were seen as res responsible for you know tumor initiation, uh, tumor progression, as well as tumor evolution. However, there is another hallmark. Of cancer cells and uh, is the capability of cancer cells of modifying their metabolism to support their increased energy requests. So actually this capability or ability of these cells is also known as metabolic reprogramming, has been also termed as the classical war-born effect and is a key player in cancer oncogenesis and also in the acquisition of drug resistance. However, the mechanism uh, underlying the, 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 this metabolic reprogramming are not well characterized yet. So just to answer to your question, what oncometabolic diseases are actually are tumors treated from a metabolic perspective. Those metabolic changes can be considered as a possible therapeutic target. Uh, I cannot hear. Yes, okay, here okay. I am. <laughs> I got carried away and I'm mic'd. Um, I think it's it's very, very important. For example, we both come from, from Italy, where, of course, there is a medical law now. And cannabis is 10 years. And it does speak about a role of cannabis within um, um, pathologies like um, oncologic pathologies, but always from a pall palliative perspective. So, for example, to decrease nausea, to increase appetite, to decrease pain, to improve the quality of sleep. These are all excellent uh, aspects of symptom management that cannabis can provide indeed for patients that are ongoing um, a, a, a pathology that relates to cancer. But mm -hmm. I find very important actually the work that you and your group have been doing because it looks at this from a very different perspective. And so I just wanted to call the attention of our audience in case they haven't. I would like to follow as well to, you know, I'll multitask while you reply and, and put this link in so they can go and read your publication as well. But your recent publication, which has, by the way, since she, she, she was just uh, giving us a little bit of uh, what, what she's been doing with uh, with her past uh, 20 years of work well she pretty much uh, kind of uh, pioneered this field so thank you that we can have actually a work thanks to people like uh, alessia and she recently co-authored with um, uh, professor vincenzo di marzo a, a very interesting uh, uh, basic basic as we say preclinical work that is suggesting that molecules like cannabigerol cbg 
and cannabidiol and CBD, so non-psychotomimetic molecules, if you will, of the plant, it seems to be in some ways useful for treatment of, as you said, hormone refractory um, cancers. In that case, was specifically for prostate cancer. So would you like to give us a bit of the insights of how that research question came to your mind and how you decided to approach it and the results of it? Thank you. Definitely. Th thanks for uh, giving me this opportunity. As you mentioned, Viola, uh, plant-derived cannabinoids have been always used for many decades as palliative agents for cancer patients. But then recently, recently I'm sure, uh, started from 2004, and uh, we were one of the group of the few groups I have to say that were pioneer pioneering. I mean, active and intense research uh, focused on uh, exploring their potential anti-tumor activity of this uh, of this molecule. So actually, not always seeing that it might be um, used against the side effect of chemotherapy, but particularly because they, they could fight, they could inhibit or block or reduce tumor growth. So actually, um, if you can see that then, uh, then, then um, phytocannabinoids were reported also to uh, modulate metabolism, and that uh, you can consider that actually um, major failure. I mean, the e, the earlier you cancer is diagnosed, the better the outcome treatment uh, is achieved. But that actually, the the reality is that uh, people die, still die for cancers, and in particular, prostate prostate cancer uh, is still killing men. And there is one particularly phase of prostate cancer, which is lethal, which is the hormone refractory phase. So prostate is an organ very, very interesting at physiological level. It has a sp special, it's actively, uh, the metabolism is, 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 is uh, highly active because, you know, this gland has to produce sperm and so on. And uh, the metabolic reprogramming, so the word boom effect in this type of cancer particular, which is hormone uh, dependent uh, is observed only in the advanced phase where actually you have kind of treatment but then at one point what I mean the best treatment is about blocking the androgen receptor signaling but then at a certain point it's like tumor cells uh, they, they could escape from this inhibitory uh, action and, and they can grow uh, despite this uh, androgen receptor signaling blockade. And so we were interested in, uh, first of all, in uh, investigating clinical uh, models or, uh, sorry, experimental models that might uh, resemble in more accurate way what happens in the human disease. We already demonstrated in, in previous publication that both CBD and CBG actually were able to inhibit in vivo and in vitro growth of human prostate cancer cells. So where in vivo, we have used xeno that more than ever for those who are not familiar, actually just uh, injection of sub sub subcutaneous injection of uh, human cells into nude mice. And then actually you, you treat this, uh, let's say, external tumor. So the first thing we want we wanted to do with GW is actually to 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 see whether these molecules could be also efficacious in where the disease is really really little. So the first thing that we've done is just settling in in vivo model. I won't go into the details of this, uh, but one thing I have to claim here is just to explain actually is that we have used a transgenic model uh, which could spontaneously develop in a multi-stage manner autochthonous and orthotopic prostate tumors uh, following this, the onset of puberty. So actually we had an in vivo model where we could uh, follow tumor progression and we treated these animals with uh, ADT, which stands for androgen deprivation therapy. And we also created and generated a hormone refractory um, prostate cancer model. So a model in which even when you block the androgen receptor signaling, you still have the growth and the relapse of this tumor. And from this tumor, 
um, we got cells and we also generated in vivo cell in vitro model uh, and the unique uniquity of these models is that they were also expressing the hyperglycolytic phenotype which is the hallmark observed in the clinical setting so once we got this picture so it's like okay let's have the car now we can start the race so we have tested uh, both CBD and CBG and as expected they were uh, potent and they they inhibit viability in bone sensitive and resistant cells but what we have noticed is that in resistant cells when I say resistant cells I always mean hormone refractory prostate cancer cells actually which also acquired a, a, um, a resistance to a drug which is used in the clinical sector things known as enzalutamide, but I'll take it short, so just call it resistant cells. So actually, going back to what I was saying, so we treated these cells and we noticed that chemo standards uh, were not active on these cells, uh, and CBD and CBG still were able to inhibit cell viability, so to block this proliferation. And of course, as a researcher, we were also interested in investigating the main mechanism of action and the potential molecular target. So we we treated these uh, cells with all the antagonists related with uh, you know plasma membrane receptor, classical. I mean, cannabinoid receptor, uh, nuclear receptor. So people are people are antagonists, but even uh, trip channel antagonists and whatever. And we found that none of these antagonists were able to counteract. The efficacy of CBD. Although in the case of uh, resistant cells, CBG was partially reversed by uh, Rimonaban by SF1, uh, so CB1 antagonist. So then we we also noticed, okay, but what, what makes these cells more sensitive? Because another peculiar aspect it was that resistant cells were more sensitive to the action of phytocannabinoids and CBD was more prominent. I mean, the effect of CBD was more prevalent than CBG. So the point was, okay, what makes these cells more sensitive? And we've noticed that since they, of course, they 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 hold uh, a kind of hyperglycolytic phenotype. So it was like these cells they um, presented smaller mitochondria. So we thought, okay, mitochondria might be a good target for CBD. And CBG. So we started investigating how both molecules were able to impact the main metabolic pathways in the cells, so glycolysis and then, um, and then also hotspots and whatever. And we found that mainly CBD was able to uh, inhibit oxphos, but also increase uh, glycolytic rates in these cells. And another thing that was really interesting was that uh, from the metabolic perspective, so when you look at the cell metabolites that were modulated or changed upon CBD and CBG treatment in resistant cells, we found that actually the, these molecules provoke divergence effects. And particularly that CBD was only, only CBD and only in resistant cells because the mechanism was totally different in sensitive cells actually. And CBD only in resistant cells were able to uh, provoke this uh, huge and massive mitochondrial swelling. It was able to accumulate within the mitochondrial fraction in up to three hours. So um, we also consider, but what is in the mitochondria? Because again, okay, from my perspective, I only, I always, whenever I have molecules, I need to find, I mean, the contrarites, I mean, the molecular targets. So one thing that we thought, and one positive target, it was a protein, mitochondrial protein called VDAC1 which was already reported to be uh, bound by CBD. But uh, VDAC is special because it's a kind of mitochondrial gatekeeper. So it's responsible for both cell metabolism and cell death. So actually what we demonstrated in this work is it was that CBD was able by binding VDAC1 
it managed to, do, to make a kind of recruitment of specific protein, mitochondrial proteins, and was able to shift, let's say, the capability of the propensity of FIDAC1 to complex with one or another. And when I say one of the other, I mean the two proteins mainly investigated were BATS, something related to the apoptosis, and exokinase 2 which is a uh, key player, key enzyme of the glycolysis rate. So actually what we, uh, although indirectly, I mean, uh, demonstrated it was that by, that mm, CBD might confine VDAC1 binding to this key metabolic enzyme, resulting in kind of an increased VDAC3 ratio of exokinase 2. And this in turn led to all the things that we, we managed to demonstrate, so apoptosis, autophagy, altered glycolytic rate, and then all the mitochondrial functions. And that whenever we block uh, the capability of VDAC1 of making so oligo on oligomerize with proteins, we lost everything. We lost the effect on the mitochondrial ATP, on mitochondrial uh, potential membrane, on mitochondrial swelling, on cell viability. On, so, so actually it was... Uh, it was really VDAC1 related. And another interesting thing, because then when we went into the in vivo and then we wanted to validate the efficacy of this molecule from the in vitro to the in vivo, you have to consider that actually to get hormone resistant uh, prostate cancer tumors in these animals, you have to wait at least 22 weeks. So it was like uh, one experiment per year, more or less. So we, we decided to validate it and to work first in vitro and then only in the initial phase when we have used so many mathematical modeling just to predict combinations and then to test in the early phase and then actually to also uh, to test in the hormone refractory phase. And what we observed is that, okay, CBD and CBG in the hormone resistant cells were both able to inhibit cell proliferation, were also able to reduce the percentage of pathological area of these tumors. But then when given in a specific combination, they were even more active. And when we use the combination, actually, we use half of the dose of the pure components. So it was really synergistic uh, effect. So... Actually, it was really, really interesting. It was really, really important. And uh, I have to acknowledge at least uh, three external collaborations, uh, collaborators of this, uh, in, of this study, which are Roberto Runga, which is a food professor at the University of Brescia, which is expert in uh, the pathology of prostate cancer. And it was also the one handling all the in vivo study. And then Professor Antonio Giordano at the IRB at Barcelona. It's this is really more by expert in mitochondrial dynamics, and particularly Professor Cerasulo, Mariana Cerasulo from the University of Portsmouth, which is expert in mathematical uh, modeling. This is, this is thanks to my team, and thanks to my meter man, the postdoc Ali Bokhtar Mahmoud. Uh, highly talented and skilled in measuring uh, mitochondrial bio bioenergetics that we we managed to achieve these big results, actually. Thank you. Well, that, that was uh, the that was quite something. I yeah, I think you touched a lot of points which I wanted to enter, but I also wanted to leave you uh, the, the, the telling space. And I found extremely fascinating. Oh, Viola, sorry for interrupting, but... Um... I don't know if... Uh, yeah, so... I think Viola's having a little bit of uh, technical difficulties, but uh, Viola, I think uh, if you're back with us now and you can hear me, if you'd just like to ask a question one more time, please. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, uh, I, I, I think, thank you, life. sorry. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's the difficulty of spotting. Um, what I was saying is that there is definitely plenty of questions I would uh, raise, but we only have a limited time. 
And and so my two questions for you, I don't know if you can address them both, would be one, how would you see the translation of all this really amazing and specific elegant work you guys carried out into humans? And the other one, um, taking on consideration what you just said, is I've been the way of pharmacology that I've been taught is that a single target is a uh, is the is the standard is the bible but then through learning actually oh sorry guys but uh feel like you're not here okay. yeah i think we we, we always having a little bit of a, a connection i, I issue. think i got the first question it was uh, related the second yeah. one i only got target Thank you. so i like the word but i didn't get the, the point. <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna I, I see that i have a little bit of connection i'm gonna try and squeeze it in here and sorry if this is uh, delaying the whole conversation but uh, what i'm trying to say is that I got really fascinated by your last statement saying that actually the combination and understanding the ratio of the two compounds was quite useful, even more useful than using the single compound. And since I guess both of us been trained on the single pharmacology type of uh, type of classes, it's uh, it's very compelling to me to see how actually the study of the endocannabinoid system and if you will of these complex uh, set of molecules with this plant is actually retraining our brain into a direction that is more of network pharmacology and, and and so i was wondering if you see this as a more applicable type of pharmacology for the type of disease that we have or at least uh, that you, you work on yeah yeah okay that that that's i fully agree with you because everything has to put uh, has to be put in in, in the right context. So I have really, I mean, we have to consider that the endocannabinoid system is uh, is a complex system, which is uh, is finely regulated, but it, it it's also it, it dynamically fluctuates. So we have not to consider to it as an as a as a statical uh, complex. Uh, and and I guess for this reason we could uh, at least in the oncological setting we could uh, we could find so many evidences of so several and so many mechanism of action uh, kind of you know receptor dependent independent TRP mediated because actually that that you cannot say that okay in the cancer and the cannabinoid you know, uh, the tone is uh, upregulated so that it's better to use this or or that so I would put everything in the context. So first of all, we have defined the pathological context. We have, uh, um, actually we have tried to, we, we look at some vulnerabilities, metabolic vulnerabilities in our case, which could be uh, potentially used that could be targetable uh, for a therapeutic approach for cannabinoids and with respect to the uh, combination yes we also okay we have no time for telling every uh, everything it's like six years of work so we have been testing so many stuff like by biochemical blood analysis and then how the combination might um, reduce possible uh, tolerability and stuff like this but actually it's really good point to study the uh combinations but i have to say that we are a bit far from being fully aware of the entire polypharmacology of all the components of cannabis so on one hand we should better characterize uh the polypharmacology and then ideally find a kind of matrix or uh, something that could be um uh, say uh, i mean tolerable but also efficacious in the pathological context we are uh, we are investigating and with respect to uh to the translation of this study um uh, i okay there are ongoing trials phase one phase one being i guess but it's with the biochemical recurrent prostate cancer where cbd actually epidalio has been treating and but it's just to determine the safety so it's about doses and stuff like this I mean, we try to provide the scientific community with uh, strong evidence that actually uh, 
many other clinical trials also with little phase of uh, cancers and in this respect with prostate cancer should be also driven organized or even considered and the reason is that because one of the uh, failure uh, of the common treatment might also be due because the treatments have limited effect on the metabolic reprogramming. So actually, development of drugs with an improved action at the reprogramming, the energy, the, the energy metabolism of cancer cells is expected to break the bottleneck problem of the current anti-tumor drugs. So actually, what, what I would hope actually is uh, or what I would suggest is to propose mole molecules like phytocannabinoids, even CBD, CBG, even investigated more in depth about combination and stuff like this, uh, as an adjunct therapy. So that you have like mm -hmm. limited side effect of chemo, you have like yeah. uh, targeting, you know, uh, even other stuff. Uh, and also contributing with reducing or uh, modulating favorably uh, the metabolic reprogramming of this uh, of this phase of cancer. Guys, I'm going to take this opportunity to jump in. Uh, we have reached the end of our 30 minutes already. Uh, I feel like we could easily keep going another 30 minutes, hour. Uh, it's it's really a pleasure to uh, to listen to you uh, uh, really describe your your research in in such a short amount of time, Alessia. So uh, I, we want to take this opportunity just to say thank you very much for for joining us and and being here with us today. Um, to everybody in the audience, again, a big thank you to you. And uh, if you liked uh, you know the, the content today and uh, you, you were uh, excited to see Alessia. Join us today. Leave us a like so more people can see the video also. Uh, also, if you have any questions anytime you watch this video, please feel free to leave them below. Uh, we do keep an eye on them. And uh, uh, also, uh, I believe, uh, Alessia, you were so kind, right, to mention. Yeah, they are. The, and everyone who wants to address any further question, they are always welcome to catch me. I mean, please send me directly an email or even a contact uh, uh, cannabis and I have to really, really thank cannabis I really admire people like you guys because uh, we need to educate. I mean, I mean, we are so many cannabis lovers, which are people who investigate the polypharmacology of cannabinoids, but also people who le legitimize recreational use based on strong scientific evidence. But we also have cannabis haters, so people that are not interested at all in exploring the therapeutic potential of these molecules, both at, at clinical and political level. So what you are doing, so the, the, the work you do, it's fundamental to, to, to break, to pave the way to, to the real use of phytocannabinoids. So that, it's me thanking you for all this. Thank you, Alessia. I think as, as Viola mentioned before we uh, uh, went live, you know, uh, all of the work that, uh, that the companies do in these industries, it's uh, it's based off of the research that you do in the lab and we are merely just trying to bridge the gap between the, the two worlds so a uh, big thank you to you and i think that we do need to have another session to continue this uh, this talk uh, i owe and, you another uh, interview i'm yes. <laughs> awesome thank it's you <laughs> thank you thank you ciao everybody thank you ciao ciao viola ciao vision and ciao hello to until all. next time <laughs> bye bye